Hello and welcome to Frost Over the World. Later in the programme, one and only Noel Gallagher tells me and you and all of us how to write a hit song. He's done so many. And we go inside the Republican race in the US. But first, the Euro and one of its key members, Finland. With unemployment still a key issue in the Euro area and countries struggling to reduce their debt and foster growth, the end of the turmoil is still far from in sight. But some countries are faring better than others. Finland, for instance, is one of four Euro area countries to have retained its AAA credit rating. Finance ministers meet in Copenhagen today to debate increasing the size of the Eurozone Debt Rescue Fund, which Finland has, at least up until now, been resisting. Well, Jyrki Katainen, Finland's Prime Minister, is with us right now. Prime Minister, welcome. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure to meet you. And re really delight to have you with us. There's one statistic here that fascinated me particularly. Finland, an Finland announced last week that it would cut the budget by nearly three billion euros. That's the next move. Since you were doing so well anyway, how can you make such an added move like that while other countries are struggling with debt? Yeah, we, we have to uh, take care of our confidence or confidence towards our economy. So that's why we have to turn to debt development downward. And by doing it, at the same time, we are putting more pressure on growth. So we are saying that we have chosen the line like gross austerity, austerity measures and growth. So gross austerity. Uh, gross austerity. Yeah. That's your new word. You've yeah. Copyright is yours. Yeah. 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 But but so that in order to maintain the momentum you've got already, you need to go further. Yeah. We need to go further, and because uh, our population is aging very rapidly, and that's why we have to take care of our public debt. Actually, by adjusting the budget, uh, now we can stabilize the debt level to 45%, which is rather good. But uh, at the same time, when we are cutting budget and raise, raising taxes, we have to do some something which encourages, especially small and medium-sized business, to invest to Finland and to, to use more money to R&D. And we need some tax incentives for small and medium-sized enterprises to, to invest especially to R&D. I see, and so and so now that that's that's the way it's, it's got to proceed. Because do you think, do you think the EU at the moment is, would you say it's a success or it's very very much in the balance whether the EU, the European Union, will prevail? Well, we are dealing with very difficult crisis, and uh, it has been very di difficult to find solutions for everybody. But I am quite satisfied how far we have gone uh, together with the EU countries. Right today, they, uh, th there are meeting of a Minister of Finance yeah. who tries to find a um, solution to firewall issue, which is very crucial. We need high enough firewall, but not too high firewall, because otherwise, if it's too high, there's, uh, there are questions, is it really credible that all the countries can take seriously their the liabilities? But the, of course, firewall must be high enough. Do you think the crisis or the solution of the crisis is clear now? It's clear because we have, uh, first of all, the EU has strengthened its rule base, which is the core issue. The re one of the reasons why we are in trouble at the moment is that all the member countries have not followed the rules, fiscal rules. Now we have the stricter rules and uh, and that this is number one of the solutions. The second is that we have uh, encourages troubled countries to do their part, which means that you have to raise taxes, make expenditure cuts, and especially liberalize the labor market and, and do the other structural reforms. And the third part is our common response, which is the firewall. We must be ready to show to the market that we have firepower in a case if the markets start uh, speculating about the sovereign bond rates of some particular country. So there are three parts to better rules in the EU. Uh, troubled countries share, they have to adjust their budget and the, the EU's common response. I, I'm very confident that this set of uh, medicines will help. Even though you have, as you just said earlier, uh, an aging population and so on, why are you doing so well? What's the secret? Why are you doing so well? Why are you maintaining 
all of these things, the AAA rating and so on. What is the secret of your success? I think there are two secrets. First is disciplined, disciplined mind. Mm. Uh, we, we take care of our public financing quite strictly. The second secret is good education. So oh. the good high level of education in principal level, but also in the university level and innovations are the, are the key because we are so dependent on export. So uh, we have to produce new innovations and commercialize the in innovations every year, every month. There must be something new coming. And we have succeeded quite well on this issue. So it had helped us through the, the terminal time. Germany and other countries, there's a strong anti-Greek feeling and having to bail them out once, mm. twice, and maybe who knows a third time and so on. Um, do Finns have the same feelings? of slight resentment and so on about bailing out Greece? Yeah. People, are, people are understandably tired of bailout packages and uh, they don't understand why some country can destroy the economy so completely that they start harming or causing trouble to the others. Mm. But uh, at the same time people understand, even though they don't like the bailout, bailout packages, they understand that it's better to try to take care of the crisis uh, in order to, to minimize the harm or damages. But uh, of course, uh, it's understandable that, uh, that uh, we need a better, stricter rules and we have to make sure that nobody can behave like this any, uh, in the future. So for, for the Finns, the rule is as it has been written. It's not the starting point for for creative interpretation. Right. So right that's right. why we, are, we have yeah. been pushing so hard new rules and tougher rules for the fiscal policy in the uh, European area. Very interesting, very clear. Prime Minister, thank you very thank much. Thank you very indeed. much. Thank, thank you. you. The race for the Republican presidential nomination goes on and on. Despite Mitt Romney's huge lead, bolstered this week by another big hitting endorsement, that of Florida Senator Marco Rubio, the other three candidates show little sign of pulling out. But why? What's going on in the other campaigns? Presidential historian Doug Weed is strategic advisor to one of them, to Ron Paul. And he joins me now, direct from a meeting in Ron Paul's office. Doug, welcome back. It's good to have you with us again. <laughs> the, um, Thank you. It's an honor. Bless you. The, the choice of the majority seems to be pretty clear. The Republicans do seem to be plumping for Mitt Romney. Uh, and some of them are saying, why don't the other three candidates withdraw? Tell us why they won't. Well, because the numbers, <clears throat> the numbers are off. The numbers that you read in the New York Times or the Associated Press are way off. Uh, <laughs> how, how off? We can't run a campaign to fulfill well, uh, they underreport what Santorum is getting, they underreport what we in the Ron Paul campaign are getting, and they overreport the number of delegates uh, that uh, Mitt Romney is getting. I can give you a clear example of that in Iowa, and I'm giving you this example because it's on the public record. I don't want to give away too much. But in Iowa, they just elected a new state chairman, and he was the Ron Paul co-chairman for Iowa, for Ron Paul for president. They threw out the Mitt Romney chairman. Now, according to the New York Times and the Associated Press, uh, Ron Paul is going to get one of the delegates from Iowa to the Republican National Convention. Romney is going to get 14. Santorum is going to get 12. Well, if we're only going to get one, how did we throw out his chairman and elect our own? The, and we, that's the body, the same body that will select the delegation that goes to Tampa. And I could give you state after state, Colorado, North Dakota, Alaska, Nevada, where the same thing is going on. So the media is assuming that these beauty contests are defining the delegation that goes to the Republican National Convention. It's not true. So what, so what in fact, do you think the, the lead that Mitt Romney really has is? Well, <clears throat> the short answer is we don't know perfectly uh, because right. deals are being made in these conventions. In another month, we're going to hear what those deals are. And when I say deals, for let me give you an example. I'll give you a mythical state that is meeting, and the Ron Paul uh, coalition may have a third of the delegates 
uh, the Santorum people another third and the Romney people another third. And it's who cuts the deal. If the Romney people can go to the Santorum people and say, we'll let you uh, split the delegation with us, uh, we'll lose out. But if, if we succeed in going to the Santorum people, Romney would lose out. So a lot of it remains up in the air, but this is not a done deal. It, it tends to look like it's a done deal because the national media at this point usually will stampede the other candidates and say, get out, get out. But the math is not there for Mitt Romney yet. There's no reason for us to get out. So that's the point about the figures and so on. So, so you think that none of the three uh, candidates that we've been talking about, nobody, nobody will withdraw before the last days, do you think? I don't. I don't think they will. For example, Newt Gingrich, he's the fourth candidate right. that we didn't talk yep. about. We don't want him out. Santorum doesn't want him out. Ron Paul doesn't want him out because if he leaves, there's the possibility that some of his delegates will move to Romney and, and uh, we will admit that Romney's in the lead. So every delegate he picks up makes a difference. So we want Newt Gingrich to stay right in there and hold the base of those few delegates that he has. Uh, a brokered convention is still unlikely in modern history history. Things happen too fast. There are brokered campaigns. You don't have to have brokered conventions. But mathematically, it is still very possible. And if it happens, it will be a show, I'll tell you. What, what would you say the tactics of the various candidates will be? And we, we haven't mentioned uh, Newt Gingrich yet either, um, because uh, obviously he's another one to consider. And you want them all. The clear thing you've said is you want them all to stay in. It increases your chances. Yes, it increases the chances of a brokered convention. And the brokered convention, as I said, is unlikely, but mathematically it's possible. And what about the white knight strategy? People dreaming of a white knight who's going to come riding in on his charger and so on. It's not going to be Jeb Bush now because he says he's, he's going with Mitt Romney and so on, but is, there, is it possible that there's a white knight out there somewhere who could charge in at this stage? It's it's possible, and in, in uh, American history in previous years, that was often the solution when you had a brokered convention. But it's very, very unlikely today. Uh, in this day and age, when a candidate is vetted, when enough people have committed their money and resources to the four that are in, it's more likely that uh, one of these four will be the candidates. And Rick Santorum, you can't rule him out. He, he has touched a nerve here. Even the Obama people are responding to it, and that relates to church and state because uh, the walls become porous and uh, for example in the little city of Canyonville, Oregon, the local city because it's not getting tax money from the nonprofits, it's doubling the water bill in Canyonville. So there are these surcharges, there are these ways that the state, that the government uh, is trying to get money from the nonprofits. So Santorum has touched something here that the Obama administration itself is sensitive to and Romney can't really get into this issue uh, much because of the controversy about his faith. So it's interesting dynamics are playing out right now. Right, and Time Magazine here has floated the idea that Ron Paul might withdraw if Mitt Romney chooses Mr. Paul's son, Rand, for vice president. Have you heard about that? <laughs> I wouldn't hold my breath that that's going to happen. <laughs> but yes, I've, I've heard that rumor. Uh, Ron Paul's a very principled person. He's been in Washington for 22 years. He hasn't taken bribes. Uh, the lobbyists can't get to him. Women haven't been able to get to him. Uh, he's, he's been untouchable. He's been pure. Won't go on a junket because he thinks it's a taxpayer paid uh, trip. Won't participate in the congressional pension plan. He, he, that's his appeal. He's this eccentric Gandhi-like figure that you can't uh, touch with the normal bribes that people respond to. So I don't think that anything Mitt Romney offers him uh, will, will move him. He will move to Romney if he feels it's in the best interest of the country and his own cause. You always look uh, cheerful whenever we talk, Doug, but uh, maybe it's a sign here of what Ron Paul's up to that you look even more cheerful now than you did a few weeks ago. Thank you very much for being with us. Could be. <laughs> Thanks, Thanks a lot. very much, David. On March the 11th, U.S. Staff Sergeant Robert Bales massacred 17 civilians in southern Afghanistan. 
This week, lawyers defending the accused argued that he was suffering from post-traumatic stress disorder. How can we best understand the circumstances that lead a person to commit such a deadly attack on innocent people? Well, one man who's been studying the nature of evil for the last 40 years is the renowned professor of psychology, Dr. Phil Zimbardo. His book, The Lucifer Effect, Understanding How Good People Turn Evil, is considered a reference book on this subject. It being based on a prison experiment that he conducted 35 years ago at Stanford University. He's also president of the Heroic Imagination Project, and he's joining me now. Welcome back to Phil Zimbardo. Welcome. Welcome. Very, good to, very good. good, very good, good, very good, good to, to see you. How, <clears throat> how do good people turn evil then? And did they have something <clears throat> specially about them before that moment that predestined that to happen? Can they be non-evil again after an evil deed like the one we mentioned? Yeah, well, first we should put that into context. It's not atypical for soldiers in war. Of course, we all recall people of our generation, the My Lai Massacre, where American soldiers in Vietnam went to this village, a My Lai. Lieutenant Cali, yeah. And massacred, killed, shot, raped, scalped, burned alive, hundreds of civilians, mostly women and children. Uh, and this was the whole company did it. Lieutenant Cali was the only one charged. And he got off. He got two and a half years of house arrest. Um, but the point is that, for me, it's the evil of war. What we see is, what war does is it trains young men to be killers. That's their job. Your job is to kill and not be killed. Uh, that's one thing. And secondly, the way, you, 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 the way you become a killer is you have to dehumanize the enemy. You have to think of people as less than human. So here's a man who has two children. How could you shoot children, other children in their head and then burn them alive? It's only because you're not shooting children, you're shooting Afghans, you're shooting Arabs, you're shooting animals. Uh, and the same thing was true in, in, uh, in uh, uh, My Lai. They, they don't, uh, people didn't realize that, I mean, the reviews never said, they actually scalped many of them, as, as we used to do with Indians, um, and then raped the women. So, so essentially what war does is it eliminates all the usual constraints on behavior, all, you know, all the limits of a human conscious, consciousness and conscience that keeps us from doing bad things. Um, so in this case, th what he did is inexcusable. You can't, he may have been suffering PTSD. Here, the military is involved. This was his fourth deployment. And each of the, he was in Iraq three times. And every time you survive and you go home, they bring you back another time. And you know you're getting closer and closer to your own mortality uh, because you can't keep doing that without yourself getting killed. Um, and so, so who, how do you allocate the brain? In the cases that we're talking to do with the war, yeah. the war is, is central and so on. But, uh, but then there's one guy, like we read about, who, yeah. who kills 17 people. And there are lots of other people in the same regiment and some don't. squadron yeah. or whatever it is yeah. who don't. Right. So Why he, is he yeah. singled out to get the treatment for somehow or other right. that, that sends him over the top, yeah. crazed and so yeah. on? And how did the, why did the others survive? So he is not doing it. Well, first of all, legally, he's guilty as charged. So uh, I got involved in defending one of the guards at Abu Ghraib, Chip Frederick, uh, who, along with all of the other guards on the night shift, did those horrific things to the Iraqi prisoners. And in my defense, I said, Your Honor, he is guilty as charged, but when you, when you look at the mitigating circumstances, it only minimizes the severity of the sentence. Uh, he is guilty, so this man is clearly guilty of premeditated murder. To say that uh, he had PTSD or other, th other uh, mitigating circumstances doesn't change the guilt. I mean, what he did is first-degree murder, and that's what he should be charged with. The question is, are there these circumstances which led him well, to mitigating, snap, so mitigating snap to go over the top? And, and so that's what we have to understand more about. Uh, why did he, in the middle of the night at 3 a.m., suddenly go on his own and start killing people? And then he went back and, and confessed. It's not that he hid this. He went back, and he was not clear he was proud of it. Certainly was not a war, uh, a war uh, 
effort. It was not part of a, ta a tactic of his squadron. So there are these bizarre individual instances, like many mass murderers who suddenly start, you know, uh, we, we had this in, um, in Virginia Tech in America, this Korean student started killing every, everybody around. There's always some, if you, if, you, if you delve into the psychology of the person, you can see, oh, here are the triggering incidents. So with that Korean student, he was isolated. For one year, nobody talked to him. He was very shy. And he was living on this campus, eating with other students, going to class. He said, for one year, nobody spoke to him. And so he felt isolated and alienated, and then said, I'm, by killing other people, they will know who I am. So this is a study you've been doing about evil through your life, about 35 years, and so on and so forth. But now I gather you've also got a project where you're focusing on finding or developing the, the heroes. Op the opposite. Well, but see, again, I mean, Sadly, because of the way I look, I look like Dr. Evil, <laughs> so I've had this career of studying evil and creating it in the laboratory, in the Stanford laboratory. And what I realize is every one of these bad situations, however bad they are, even in the Holocaust, there are always some people who stood up, spoke out, took action against injustice. So throughout the world, Israel has identified people, Christians who were righteous, who stood up, defended uh, and, and risk their lives to save Jews, especially Jewish children. And this is true in every evil setting. There's always people who defy unjust authority, and that's what we're t talking about is evil, as evil, uh, as the opponents of evil are heroes. So heroes are not celebrities, they're not um, you know, uh, a athletes who win awards. H heroes are people who come to the aid of others in need or defend a moral cause, aware that there's a cost. Life or limb, whistleblowers uh, always risk their career. So this is what our organization is trying to do, is honor, uh, celebrate everyday heroes, because most heroes are ordinary people. But then we're trying to do more. We're trying to use education and psychology to train kids how to be heroes. And you begin by saying, first you have to be aware of the power of the dark side. We have to fortify you against the dark side. Because there are influence professionals, people out there whose job it is to recruit kids to steal, to sell drugs, to take drugs, to smoke cigarettes, yep. to join gangs. Yep. And so first, we teach you, here's the techniques they use. Then we inspire you to be a hero, giving you examples of kids or people like you, boys and girls, who've done heroic deeds. And then we, we coach you. Here's something you can do every day uh, in, as a hero in training. So, so this is what our program is. We're in San Francisco, but we certainly want to be in London, we want to be in the UK, we really want to be around the world because our message is really very simple. It's that evil, the, the heroism is the antidote to evil. Thank you so much for being Thank with us. Thank you, David. Good, good luck with this new project. We look forward to hearing how it goes. I hope it here. goes well. Thank Phil, you. I'm sure it will. With you behind it, of course it will. In a moment, that titan of 21st century rock music and 20th century as well, of course, Noel Gallagher. That's after this short, incredibly short, break.